So uh, my name is Martina Rana. I'm uh, from the Bone Lab in Dresden, from TU Dresden. And uh, we are today at a webinar, webinar that is part of the Fidelio uh, EU network. And uh, this is a training network for research into bone fragility and diabetes in Europe. And as a training network, we also want to have some more training topics in our webinars. And one very important topic today is about open science and what that is exactly and um, uh, yeah, how to deal with that with, for your data, but also for publishing. And uh, for that, we're very lucky that we have two speakers here today from the TU Dresden. And uh, they're also part of the um, University Library of Dresden of the state of Saxony. And uh, they are going to give us a nice introduction. And as I see, um, Michael also has put some comments into the chat box. So feel free to um, put questions in the chat box if they pop up during the presentation. Um, and otherwise, yeah, I think everyone already muted themselves. So we will turn off our cameras and microphones, except for the speakers. And with that, thank you again, uh, Johannes and Alan, for coming. And we're looking forward to the presentation. Yeah, thank you, Martina, um, and thank you for the invitation. Um, it's really nice to be here. Um, yeah, so I'm Alan. Uh, Johannes is working somewhere in the background and um, will maybe monitor the chat and will join us then for the question and answer session. <clears throat> right, so um, before we really get into things, I'd like you to take a moment and just think about um, the last time you were maybe writing a proposal or a paper or whatever and you came across this one um this one paper that seemed really awesome that you definitely needed for whatever you were doing however no access maybe you searched maybe you tried other places maybe you had a look on on sci-hub maybe you tried researchgate um but no luck you were not able to obtain access so, what do you think happened to this paper? I guess you probably all uh, have guessed that it won't be cited. It won't be cited by you. So, tough luck for the authors. Um, now, take another moment and consider the, uh, the most important factors that govern um, scientific careers these days. Um, the most important currency are citations. Um, this is basically a number that will let other people will let other people um, make assumptions about how influential your research is, or even how good it is. This is also kind of problematic, but that's a whole another another topic. Um, so anyway, it's a it's going to be a pity for the authors that you weren't able to cite them, obviously. Right. So Johannes and I are here today um, to prevent this to happening to you. Um, and to tell you about open science. Okay, this is today's agenda. Um, we have various topics. Mm, the general idea um, is that we would like you to, I mean, we won't be able to, to go into all aspects of open science, but we'd like you to, to take home with you, or maybe you are at home actually. Uh, anyway, we'd like to convey just a, a general idea of the concept and the ideas behind open science. What is open science? What might it be? What, uh, what distinguishes it from conventional science? Or does anything, uh, how does it differ con from conventional science or does it even differ? Um, so we'll speak about that, give you some tips on how you can maybe start um, making your research more open. Our second topic, open access, um, probably something that you have come into contact in one way or the other, either by not being uh, not being able to obtain access to a paper or maybe even by publishing open access, hopefully. Um, we will then speak about open licenses, um, in particular CC licenses, so Creative Commons licenses, and um, yeah, we'll let you know why they are important, why you should be licensing things to make them more open. And um, our last topic will be open data, um, where we will we'll speak a bit about open data and um, give you like a sort of a cookbook, how to publish your data openly. <clears throat> okay, so let's get started. Um, 
these are the four pillars of open science. This is maybe sort of what you know if you've ever heard of uh, open science before. This is maybe kind of the, the concept that you have in mind. Um, yeah, we're only going to be speaking about two pillars of open science. Hopefully the temple won't, won't collapse uh, during the course of this presentation, but we have other things, licenses, so maybe it'll, it'll hold up, hopefully. However, um, this definition that many scientists uh, might use, or this understanding of open science, we uh, librarians like to think a bit broader, in a, the, a bit of a broader sense about open science. Um, I have this uh, quotation, which I can't read because part of the presentation is blocked. I'll just give you a minute to read through it. Okay, so this is obviously a very, very broad definition. Um, this is maybe, it's very open, which makes sense. If this is about open science, then maybe the definition should be open as well. Um, I really like this definition actually, because it's, it's so inclusive somehow. And um, I think that's maybe a bit more of the concept that we librarians have of open science. So here's a rendition of, uh, another rendition of open science. Um, there may be some aspects here that you don't really know what to do with, like open tab books, workflow, um, science blog. Okay, well, that's self-explanatory, but open annotation, citizen science. Um, those are maybe things that you wouldn't necessarily directly uh, connect with, with science and open science. Um, but this is really important to, to open science, as I understand it, at least and this aspect of inclusiveness. So basically the idea that I have when I think of open science is that science should be open to everyone. Yeah, science is paid for by the by um, by society. It should be open to society um, so that they can partake in it, even in the in the production of science and also benefit from um, from research. Okay, here's another openness uh, slide that I included mainly because I think it's a really neat, uh, awesome picture. So um, this is even a, this is a further escalation of the idea of openness. All sorts of stuff here that you might not even think about. Open cloud, open government, open space, open music. Yeah, this is our last definition. Open science is just science done right. Um, I would tend to agree with this. You may not, um, but it does um, pose a uh, it does pose some questions to think about open science in this way. Um, does it mean that you've been doing science wrong all the time if you haven't been doing open science, or does it mean that you have already been doing open science? Um, hard to tell. Um, another question might be why isn't everybody doing open science if it's uh, the only way to do it? So obviously open science and um, doing open science is yeah, a, a sort of a vague, vague concept. And there are actually also reasons that prevent, might prevent you from practicing open science. Yeah, so I've, I've listed some obstacles here. Um, there are probably others as well, but these are just some, some brief ideas. Commercial in interests, yeah, you might be in a, in a a, a, a private um, public partnership. Your research might be connected to patents or something that you can't, um, yeah, that you can't publish along with, for instance, your data. Privacy issues might um, play a part in um, preventing open science. Um, I guess this probably goes for, for you um, medicine people in particular. Uh, there are also systemic obstacles. The academic culture, the way it is, um, is, is not does not necessarily um, reward openness, right? So the reputational systems don't work um, by um, rewarding people that um, publish open access uh, or publish all, all of their data. Um, <clears throat> other factors um, govern reputation in science. Um, the last. Obstacle is actually a very, very real one. Um, 
doing open science, practicing open science requires extra effort and it requires extra time. That's just the way it is. Okay, so what is this open science in regards to conventional science? Um, I would say that it's a relatively arbitrary distinction um, because science is in many regards open. The whole, um, um, the, the whole scientific discourse is a relatively open discourse that builds upon um, publications that are um, that people read and can then um, develop their own research on. <clears throat> so this is actually a problem. This uh, differentiation between open science and conventional science. It's, it's, it's like this, this one is this new concept, this, this paradigm shift. Um, and the other is like wrong. So that's very judgmental and um, <clears throat> doesn't, doesn't make sense in a lot of, in a lot of ways. So what, what else is open science? Open science is an ideal. It's not something tangible. It's not something that you can either do or not do. It's not something you can, you can win at. It's not something you can lose at or do wrong. And that's perfectly fine. Um, I think maybe uh, we got an idea um, that open science is not something that is completely defined. And that's actually good news. Um, it means that you can define for yourself what openness means to you or what openness means to your research. You can decide for yourself what your concept of open science is the way uh, I just did it. And the last point, open science is a gradual process. Um, it's not something that you turn on and you don't simply um, wake up one morning and you're an open scientist. It's, it's, it's a process. It's maybe a, a form of cultural change. <clears throat> okay, so um, we've spoken a bit about what open science could be. Um, the question now would be, how can you start doing it? Okay, so this is, this is basically my proposition how anybody can get started with open science. Um, you need to educate yourself about the concept of open science. What, what, what's the philosophy of it? You need to know about it. You maybe should know what tools there are, um, what, what people actually do, how they practice open science. That would be the first step. The second step is to basically constantly reflect on what you're doing, constantly reflect on your research and just sort of ask yourself, is there something I could do to make it a little tiny bit more open? and um, <clears throat> maybe implement that. The idea is that um, you, yeah, that, that the transition to open science is, is a gradual one, right? You can just sort of aim your research in the right direction and um, from that point, it'll just go automatically. <clears throat> okay, we will continue now with open access. Um, Open access is a, uh, is a topic that is very important to librarians. Um, librarians aren't generally people who will get extremely emotional, um, but actually I've, I've witnessed librarians really screaming at each other because, because of open access and paywalls and the such. Okay, so um, this is something to, to visualize. 90% of all scientific publications are behind paywalls. That's a lot, obviously. So there might be cures for diseases, really important research. There might be papers that will provide the basis of you winning the Nobel Prize or whatever, but you're never gonna know because possibly you just can't get a hold of them unless you obviously pay a lot of money. And publishers like to, well, for profit uh, publishers like to charge astronomic sums, uh, sums for access to articles, articles that you wrote, um, articles that um, you are not getting paid for, um, articles that actually you have to pay for to be published so that the people that are publishing can make money off of them. This is obviously not a really fair system. <clears throat> Yeah, it is financially impossible even here in Germany to provide access to really all open access uh, public, not open access, all closed access 
publications or publications that are behind some sort of paywall. It's just financially not possible. Um, now imagine how this would be for a, uh, a poorer country, right? Um, basically, many countries are, are cut off from legal access to databases. And that's, that's not good because um, <clears throat> that means they can't participate in, um, in the scientific discourse as they should be able to. Okay, um, we already spoke about the poor authors who were not being cited by you at the very beginning. Um, it's not just uh, negative, yeah? You're not just not gonna be cited if you don't do open access. Actually, there are studies that, that show that you will be cited much, much more often if you do publish open access. So this is, this is good news, and maybe you should think about getting on the, on the uh, train in that direction. Okay, we have an example here of an open access journal. It's uh, plus one. I assume a lot of you or all of you know it. Um, <clears throat> what um, distinguishes it um, against uh, for-profit journals is that publication, for example, is not dependent on perceived importance. Yeah, obviously big journals are gonna want to publish what they think will make them the most money or is the is the most prestigious. Um, this doesn't necessarily have to be um, the most important research. And it doesn't have to be the best research. <clears throat> yeah, another factor is community open peer review. Um, you all probably know about the peer review process. You've probably been through it a couple times. Um, it's something that is extremely untransparent and transparent. Um, so this is this is something that that helps bring transparency to um, to peer review. Articles in Plus One are uh, licensed with CC uh, licenses. We're going to talk about them later. I already um, mentioned that. One thing that you need to keep in mind, though, um, when you publish open access, it doesn't mean that the publishing doesn't cost anything. However, um, usually publishing is um, much less expensive than in for-profit journals. Okay, so what possibilities do you have to publish open access? Um, there's the possibility of publishing preprints on, on preprint servers. Um, these are non-peer-reviewed versions. You could theoretically publish them on a, on a server and then have them peer-reviewed openly. It's a good idea, even before you submit them to a, a journal. And um, two, two possibilities um, to, to publish open access in journals are green open access and gold open access. So green open access um, means that you um, publish a, a paper that you've written yourself um, in a repository. Uh, for instance, an institutional repository in Dresden um, at, the, at the library, we have one called Kukosa. Um, however, you need to be careful when you um, decide to publish green open access. Very often, publishers will place an embargo period on, um, on secondary publication. And this is something that can be negotiated quite often, but you just need to know this. And in Germany, you actually have, a, uh, you have the right to publish a, uh, a paper that has been published. You have a secondary publishing right. So after a year's time, you can publish it again, which is definitely a good idea uh, in terms of being cited. Right, gold open access um, means publishing in an op online open access journal um, from the very beginning. Um, this can be done um, either in uh, nonprofit um, journals like Plus One, or all of the major journals also have um, open access uh, packages because they've realized that they can make a lot of money out of publishing open access. A lot of uh, libraries and universities um, have open access publication funds because they love open access so much. They're willing to actually pay for your, uh, for your paper to be published open access. Just uh, speak to your librarians, speak to people at your university and find out whether this maybe applies to you and you can also start publishing open access. 
Okay, we will continue now with open licenses. <clears throat> yeah, why should you be licensing things that you produce at all? Um, <clears throat> again, there's a, a quotation here that I cannot completely read. Express the conditions under which the work can be accessed and um, yeah, the rest is invisible to me and modified. Okay, so um, we live in a globalized world um, and every country has their own copyright legislature. Um, and copyright legislature is not something that you necessarily want to um, really have to get into, right? So um, for this uh, to be able to, to um, yeah, to avoid having to, to you know, know um, Chinese copyright, um, the Creative Commons licenses were developed, um, so they're standardized. Yeah, they're, they're, they live on the internet. Everybody can uh, has access to them and can understand what, what they're about. They're very simple. Yeah, you don't have to study law to, to understand them. You don't have to study law to apply them. Anybody can do it. And they're machine readable, which is very important for distant reading or, or um, crawling repositories. I just really briefly want to go into, uh, we'll just sort of jump over a couple of open licenses. Um, this is not gonna be in depth. This is something that you need to, need to, <laughs> you need to educate yourself on too. So there are various uh, open licenses. Um, the most open one is CCO, CC0, um, which basically means that you can do with the, um, the thing that has been licensed with it as you like. This is actually a very, very powerful license and a very good license also. It may seem a bit counterintuitive that you should, as, a, as an academic, um, publish things with CCO because you want to, you want to be cited. Um, however, um, the norms of um, scientific good scientific practice um, stipulate that you have to be cited. So this is actually not that big and a, a danger as you might think. Okay, CC BY, um, very common, uh, means that the creator must be credited. And, and then it gets more complicated. So we have CC BY and D, no derivatives allowed. And the most restrictive license is CC NY, NC, ND. Um, <clears throat> so share with appropriate credit, no changes permitted, um, no commercial use. Um, <clears throat> you need to know if you're licensing your work, which you should, as we just just uh, found out, um, any restrictions in licensing can be a deal breaker to others who want to use your publications. Okay, so why is that? Um, these are questions you might ask yourself. Um, if something is, is, um, is licensed uh, non-derivatives, is citing and building upon the publication a derivative? Or when is use commercial? Yeah, you might be you may be publishing a book, and um, in academia, I guess you're not liable to really make any money off of it. But who knows? You might, right? Um, so this is something to keep in mind. That actually these um, these questions aren't aren't but so clear even for experts, and they're 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 subject to to debate. So what is going to happen if you use super complex licenses for your um, publications, data, whatever? Most researchers are just not going to be bothered to try to figure out what they're allowed to actually do with it, how they're actually allowed to use it. Okay, so this is uh, what we usually recommend people use CCO to enable reuse. And this is especially true of data. CC BY is okay too. <clears throat> okay, this is really going fast. Um, we have arrived at open data. <clears throat> Again, the um, quote I have here is partially blocked, but I will try to read the parts that I can see. Open research data is data that can be freely accessed, reused, remixed, um, redistributed for academic research and so on. Okay, so what does this mean? This means that you have research data, um, you let other people use it and they do with it as they see fit. Right, this may actually seem sort of counterintuitive as well, because um, you maybe 
it may have been a lot of work to, to generate this data and why should you be giving it to, for free to others? Um, they should just not be quite so lazy and do it themselves. But actually there are real tangible benefits um, to open data. <clears throat> the first um, point is transparency, um, which is obviously very important. You may have heard of the replication crisis where um, in many different disciplines, people suddenly noticed that research, um, that the publications, the re research results just plainly couldn't be verified anymore. Um, and actually to me, this is a, another one of those, those points that is actually a basic principle of science. Yeah? Um, obviously you want people to, to understand how you arrived at your conclusion. So it makes perfect sense to, um, <clears throat> To, to do open data for that reason. Okay, the second point, um, in closed science, um, nobody necessarily knows what other people are up to. Um, it might be that other people are working on the exact same thing as you are. Um, maybe the same negative experiment is being run in 1,000 different labs, um, although the data already exists somewhere. So this is obviously a massive waste of time and resources. You might be able to profit from someone else's data just as much as someone might be able to profit from yours. Another important uh, thing, uh, point is that your data might have more potential than you imagine. Basically, the shelf life of data can be much higher than shelf life of a, um, of a um, publication. Um, <clears throat> Right? Um, science is in constant change. Um, the results that you, uh, that you maybe um, arrived at, they may be invalid. Um, some, someone may refute them. Um, so basically, yeah, you can never know. Maybe your peer review process is, is taking so long that um, you've been, your, your, your publication is out of date by the time that it's published. Um, and the thing is with data, it's, it's, um, it may remain valid. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's, not, uh, it's not an interpretation like a paper might be, it's, it's their facts, it's information. So it, per se, it has a more validation, more validation to it. <clears throat> yeah, another very important thing, um, you don't um, necessarily know what other people might be able to do with your data, right? People have different perspectives. This is, obviously especially true in um, heterogeneous uh, disciplines like the life sciences. Who knows what somebody else can, can do with your data? Data. Who knows what they can pull out of it? This is obviously um, true also in, in data science where it's really, yeah, the, the, the scientists can um, basically, yeah, <laughs> make a lot of the p potential that, that any kind of data has. Yeah, and the possibly most convincing reason for open data is that funders absolutely love it. Um, funders increasingly expect you to publish your data openly. This is true, for instance, for Horizon 2020, and um, there is a certain tendency um, in Europe and uh, also in the US um, that it, it, it will be a future requirement to publish open data. So, it might make sense to sort of align your, your research with this, um, with this tendency as soon as possible. <clears throat> okay, so now we've found out about open data. How do you go from there? How do you publish it? You publish data in repositories. Um, I have a couple listed here, Zenodo, Opara. These are um, interdisciplinary repositories. The Opara repository is uh, one is a repository of the TU Dresden. There are two others here, Dryad and Pigshare. Those are disciplinary um, repositories. Maybe you even know them. Um, we are often asked as uh, research data managers at the library um, how to go about finding a, a proper repository, the best repository. And um, actually we can't help you much there because you know your data best, you know where it needs to be, you know who might look where. So. Um, this, uh, I've posted a, a link to V3Data, which is a meta search engine um, where you can search for fitting repositories for your data. 
Another question is what data to publish at all? And the easy answer to this is um, publish data that you might need or that somebody else might need. Um, that implies data that might be interesting to others. As I say, you can't always know what data might be interesting to others. Um, another important reason would be um, to, to publish data that your research is based on, yeah? so that your results are reproducible. Right, um, so what does your data need to look like when you publish it? How does it need to be structured? How does it need to be formed? Um, <clears throat> this brings us to the so-called fear principles. <clears throat> and this is the last slide, so we're almost there. And just bear with me. So the fear principles, fear, is an acronym for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Okay, findable. Obviously, to uh, publish data so that it's findable, you need to stick it in a repository. We, we already spoke about that. Um, however, you need to describe it. You need to describe it so that people and machines, humans and machines can actually find it. How do you describe it with so-called metadata? Um, so, that would just be um, a description of like you, the author of your data, um, the, the license you're giving it, what the data actually contains, um, when you generated it, how you generated it. Okay, accessible. Um, your data needs to be accessible to others. Um, you can do this by providing a, uh, a retrievable a, a, a way of retrieving your data. Um, you can do this in form of a persistent identifier, a, a DOI. You may have heard of DOIs, um, digital object identifiers, um, in the context of um, journals and um, publications on the internet. So this is basically a, a link um, where you can, that identifies the data and where you can, with which you can, oh God, with which you can retrieve the data. Um, persistent means that the link won't stop working after a while. Okay, interoperable. Um, <clears throat> people and machines need to understand uh, what data they're dealing with. So how do you do this? You use standards, you use um, vocabularies, um, basically descriptions that many people and even machines can understand and interpret. Usable. This is the last uh, fear um, <clears throat> um, part, reusable. We already spoke about this, licensing your data, ideally, if it's data, which in this case it is, ideally CCO. Okay, um, <clears throat> this pretty much concludes our uh, presentation. Um, just one or two more things. Obviously, um, the transition to open data is um, not necessarily easy. It's something you need you need to think about. And as I say, follow the two steps: the uh, the, the cookbook of studying open data that I gave you before. Um, but it's okay to need help, and if you need help, you may contact us. Um, we can help you with various things, data management plans, so plans for funders. Funders want to know how you're, how you're managing your data, how you plan to manage your data, and we can help you with, with, with these plans. Um, if you want to optimize your data management as a whole, you can contact us. Um, publishing data, we already spoke about repositories. Um, most institutions have at least one repository for data. Um, and these are not, uh, these are not um, Dresden specific things, yeah, almost every library, every university is liable to have some form of um, help. Open access publications, um, we have a team dealing with that. Um, I already mentioned the open access fund. If you're a, a researcher based in Dresden, then that's something you should know about and make use of if possible. Okay. Um, that does conclude the presentation now. Thank you for your attention. And um, yeah, I guess we can um, transition now to the question and answer.
parts.